I couldn't like stop him from sliding more. I tried to arrest and then arrest and arrest. It turned out we ended up tumbling down like a thousand or fifteen hundred feet. Welcome back to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast. I am Dr. Sarah Spellsberg, and I am your host for this edition, retired USAF pararescueman and flight paramedic with Guardian Flight Alaska. Our guest tonight is paramedic John Davis, and in this installment, we are going to discuss the differences in military and civilian rescue operations, how the two can merge and collaborate, and some of the extreme tasks paramedics undertake to reach their patients in remote Alaska. So I'm joined by paramedic John Davis. He was a uh, United States Air Force com combat controller for six years, a United States Air Force pararescueman for 15 years, firefighter paramedic with Anchorage Fire Department for eight years, and a flight paramedic with Guardian, for, uh, which is a one of the commercial medevac operators in Alaska for one year. And so John Davis, thank you very much for joining me today. Welcome to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast. Thanks for having me, Sarah. And so when, when you were young, did you, what did you picture as a career when you got older? Because your career has become a very interesting portfolio beast. And so what did you, what were you picturing when you were little? Uh, you know, <clears throat> my mom, my mom was a nurse. She was an RN and uh, that being part of my life was a, a big thing. And she always talked about how helping people was a big part of her, her life. And, um, what made her happy. And, uh, and so I kind of started going down that road with Boy Scouts in my first aid merit badge and then lifeguard merit badge. And then I became a surf lifeguard, uh, in Rhode Island on the ocean. And then, and then just kind of, I don't know how it all happened. I don't know what took me to the recruiter's office, but, um, then ended up joining the military. And then there was a little hiatus with the, uh, with, taking care of people. Um, and that's when I was a combat controller for those six and that, years. And that's incredible. So, so you joined the air force right out of high school, active duty. And, um, and so you're not, do you remember what inspired this decision? Yeah, no, it's kind of bizarre. I actually, it, it's, it was really weird. I, I do remember asking, uh, I had applied to colleges and, and was, was ready to do that. But like down deep, I didn't think I was ready to do it. I didn't think I was mature enough to go and take that step and waste money. And I was like, for some weird reason, I just asked a friend to take me to the recruiter's office. Didn't tell my mom or dad or anything. And uh, and and they told me <clears throat> that I had a guaranteed job and and to be a physical therapy assistant. And uh, it turns out that wasn't the case. Uh, when I got to basic training, no. they said you can choose from this list of jobs, and and I was like, I don't, I don't want to do any of those jobs. The recruiter told me I had this other job, so um, yeah. So back to your question, I'm not sure what took me there. I mm -hmm. I do have a, a a long line of military people in my family. My dad was in Vietnam. Sure. My brother went to. My brother is actually a two star general in the army now. Um, anyway, there's and there's a lot of military in my family seemed like wow. a secure stepping stone for me yes yes and, and and so straight out of the gates pretty much you end up hucking yourself out of airplanes into austere environments and setting up um what is arguably i think one of the most important assets in any wartime or disaster situation and that's communications is that correct that's right, that's right sarah <laughs> command and control is is a humongous thing and um and then of course getting these assets and the people to, to the battlefield and in, in a quick and expedient way and you do that by setting up airfields and and jumping out of planes and doing things like that and controlling all that air traffic all traffic air, excuse me air traffic coming to those dirt strips all around wow so would you so, jump out of the plane with all of your equipment too or or would there would equipment land separately Yep, we would we would always have equipment that we care like it was a like a ruck sack that we would attach to our harness whether we were free falling or doing static line jumps. Uh, didn't uh, either way, and of course our rifles. Um, 
But as far as the big equipment that we would use, we would airdrop that. We would have we would actually airdrop motorcycles and we would land next to the motorcycle package and go and derig the motorcycles, start them up and go and clear the runway, set the runway up at nighttime on MVGs to to then bring in the the air land uh, package. Wow. And so this is, I, I mean, these are, these are have to be some pretty austere, extreme places. And so, I mean, what kinds of places and climates did you jump into? Did you kind of have to be ready for anything? Jungle, <clears throat> Arctic, uh, desert? Yes, all of the above. Uh, when, however, when I was a combat controller, none of the wars were going on. And so I was, a, I was a combat control during, controller during peacetime. And, uh, and so it was all just training. So we would go and do training all around the world. I was stationed in Japan for a while. So we would go to do it all over Southeast Asia and um, yeah, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, uh, Guam, and the Micronesia chain in there. But yeah, we would do a lot of practice all around there for sure. And so when in all of this did you become a paramedic? So uh, I, so I, I had a six year enlistment uh, with, with the active duty Air Force yeah, that, I, that I had to fulfill. And I knew kind of right away that the active duty Air Force wasn't for me. I just, and I didn't, and I knew, I started to learn that um, calling in airstrikes and doing things like that wasn't part of who I am uh, down deep. <clears throat> I'd rather help people. Um, uh, so I separated from the active duty air force and went directly into the air national guard as a full-time guardsman. And, uh, uh, and they sent me to, um, the joint special operations combat medic course in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. At the time they, there was a joint, um, push to get all of the medics, uh, in the special operations world trained the same way at the same place. And, um, and so that went on, that, that school was alive for a few years, but then everyone decided to go their separate ways. I thought it was a great opportunity. So that's where I got my paramedic. And then, um, and then they send me to para, uh, pararescue school in Kirtland, Air Force Base, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And then you spend a year and a half there doing all different types of things. Um, um, Did you volunteer for this or were you voluntold for this? No, I volunteered for it, and I volunteered for it with the I t with in the auspice that I was going to be stationed here in Alaska to do because I knew that I knew that this team here did a lot of civilian rescue, um, and they did a lot of um, uh, they did trips on Denali and did rescue with the uh, National Park Service climbing rangers. So it was it was a it was a kind of an environment that I'm interested in that I you know I always like to climb and be outdoors and and such. That's great. Yeah. And so how much time did you spend on Denali? Uh, I've been up there three times and each time you're going on patrol, you're, you're there for a month. And, uh, and you, so you would go, you start at 7,000 at base camp and you go up when you're on a patrol, then you make your way up to the advanced base camp at 14,000 feet. And there, the park service flies in a whole bunch of with uh, stuff, um, including food and propane and heaters and tents, and to kind of kind of base their higher al altitude rescue situation. Um, and then, in the middle of all this, did you end up de deployed again? Yeah. So being uh, yeah. So every once, two thousand uh, September eleventh happened i'd say that we were deployed every 18 months um so and we would typically have a chunk of four months at a time for those deployments every 18 months if that makes sense so mm -hmm. you may not go on the mountain for or on denali for a year or two and then you'll come back and you'll just roll back in there if that's something that you wanted to do it's something i like to do Oh, I, I think it sounds amazing. Um, did you ever feel on in your time on Denali? Did you ever feel like I might end up needing rescue up here because either the weather went south or I, I know it's a, it's a very technical mountain. Yeah, you know, I <clears throat> I I don't I can say that I didn't feel that way. 
uh, because if, if you have the proper training and equipment um, and you know how to conduct yourself, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's all very basic. It's just kind of doing things to stay alive. And whether it, if your tent gets torn apart in the wind, then you just dig a hole in the snow and live in a snow cave until the storm subsides. Like, you, and then you just keep on digging the hole out so you don't suffocate in there. But uh, I don't, I don't think I've felt that way. Uh, oh, I maybe <laughs> uh, one particular time on Denali, I, I, um, we were coming back down from the summit and there was one section that goes from Denali pass <clears throat> back to the 17,000 foot camp. And uh, my partner, uh, and it's called the Autobahn and it's called the Autobahn because a lot of people fall on it. It's a, it's a long side hill and, and, uh, and people fall and slide um, and die and get hurt. Um, so on our way back down this one particular day, um, my partner fell and, and I couldn't arrest him. I couldn't like stop him from sliding more. I tried to arrest and then arrest and arrest. It turned out we ended up tumbling down like a thousand or 1500 feet, uh, with no incident. But I mean, maybe that was the time when I thought that might be it, but, uh, it worked out. <laughs> In, in the moment of that, it, 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 that would have felt like a pretty dire situation to me. Um, but yeah. it sounds like you guys, you guys s s slid yeah. down and slid it out together and, and yeah. came out uh, without, without injury. Oh, that's, well, I'm glad you both came out without injuries. Um, yeah. So you're on Denali, you're deploying to presumably dry that desert climates. Um, yep. Afghanistan. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, were you paired? You were para jumping over there too. You were a paramedic. Yeah. So our our main our main mission as para rescue men is to um, is to be there for our air crew members if they get shot down, whether it's jets, fighter jets, or C one thirties, or other helicopters, or whatever. That's our main. That's the and and to recover DoD assets, um, and that's the main mission. Uh, however, unlike uh, like Vietnam, our our adversary wasn't. They weren't shooting down a lot of planes, and we weren't crashing a lot of planes. There were, however, a lot of people getting uh, severely injured, blown up, shot up uh, <clears throat> uh, on the ground. So we kind of morphed into doing a lot of medevac, and and I think what would happen typically is our our um, helicopters and our helicopter crews uh, and our helicopters have guns mounted on them. And so oftentimes when the ar armies um, was called to do a medevac and it was too high a risk for them, we will go in because we have guns and we can fight our way in and fight our way out of a, of a, of a landing zone or a hoist zone or something like that. Um, so yeah, uh, that, so that was the, turned out to be our primary situation over there, whether it's extricating people from Humvees or those big vehicles that you've seen, and then they get blown up. Um, and then of course, doing all the medical care that's needed to and then en route back to the base. And then uh, on occasion, you would get farmed out to a uh, uh, Army Special Forces team and be attached to them as their medic in embedded SAR person, um, and then, um, uh, or SEAL teams either way, if they were down a medic or whatever. So was it difficult to sort of attach to a team that's been working together for presumably months to years and, and fit into their flow, so to speak? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think oftentimes it comes down to the personality of, of who, who's going to be going and being be attached to that team and and each team um, oftentimes they have strong cohesion and they don't like outsiders but I can say that uh, often we were always welcomed because they their medics were tired of doing that work and um, yeah additionally I think the first few deployments that I went on in Afghanistan when I would get attached to an SF team, uh, I knew the medics because I had gone through school with them at in Fort Bragg. So it was kind of like a reunification and, and they were psyched to see me and I was psyched to see them and we'd go do our business. 
I love that. Yeah. Now, something I try to touch on and that's sometimes a difficult topic for for some people. It seems like it's a easier topic to talk uh, to re to broach more recently, but and it affects a lot of people in the military and SAR and extreme medicine. And what are I mean, you've obviously been in some pretty intense situations. So, what are some of the coping skills you've learned to employ to balance your life and and to avoid a traumatic stress injury? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that you can avoid the injury. I think that that's just inherent in the, in the business. Um, and, but I guess my answer to Sarah is, is very basically, you just don't use, choose things that are destructive in your life or just destructive in general, like drinking or using drugs or things like that, staying healthy, talking about it, um, seeking help when when things become overwhelming if they become overwhelming uh, from professionals that have uh, experience with um, people that have severe trauma uh, so yeah i, I love that, that answer yeah that that is perfect um and it's very similar to um and i was i interviewed another um a person who deployed with both the Australian and the U.S. armies, and and they had a very similar uh, answer: was whatever your coping mechanisms are, make sure they're not not destructive. And right. uh, I, I think that's that's really good advice. And I like yeah. it that um, people are talking about it more too. My my SAR team, even back in the '90s, we had to debrief. They made us, and I and sometimes we debriefed with a counselor if it was a really intense rescue or if it was someone we all knew, which often it was. Um, yeah. and, and I, I, I think that that those habits set me up for life with how to, how to deal with the things that we see. Absolutely. You know, it's interestingly enough, a friend of mine is a, is a social worker that, uh, that works for the VA and he does a lot of, um, tele, um, health stuff with people that live in Western Oregon <clears throat> in kind of remote areas where there isn't, there aren't a lot of, uh, services for these vets. And he put out a, a uh, he put out a clinic one weekend. It was a two day situation, just to talking about PTSD, signs and symptoms, and and how to deal with it all. And when during one of the breaks, I asked him how. And this was maybe ten years ago now, but I asked him how how many people from Iraq and Afghanistan he's dealing with. He's like, yeah, you, like you could imagine, we're dealing with some. He says, but really, we're dealing with people from Vietnam because they uh they have they came home from the war they got a job they busied themselves with their new families and lives and now they're retired and when they retire they don't have anything to occupy their brains so i i think that uh that that's a, a really important thing for people to consider we all want to stay busy that's kind of what we do um but just keeping tabs on on what is what kind of history you have with those with that trauma is important not to just let it stay buried yes and and i think we we kind of failed our vietnam vets yeah uh, in so many ways in so many ways um yeah and i think another point and I, i'm sorry to to keep going on about this but um I, I another point it. is at the at that joint special operations uh, medical um school that i went to I think we had a day or a whole day or possibly two whole days of training that revolved around that, which is important. And I do think that the military is attending to those things. I, I do training. too. And I feel like I do too. And I feel like it's a easier conversation to have. And, you know, when we did a, we did a special forces critical care course uh, for the military, we hosted at Mayo and it, it came up a lot and these guys were very open about it and they're very open about how they coped and you know what they were trying you know what they thought worked for them and and i i just i i was really proud because i i'm like this is this is the way out for them this is the norm this is the path to a normal life and i'm just really proud of the emotional um, growth and the maturity that they displayed um and i and i love it that that, that that's a normal conversation to have now right. for you all and so, so you separated from active duty and you joined full-time Air National Guard in Alaska. You're in yep. peacetime during your, during your active duty. And now you're in the Air National Guard and you're deploying to, to wartime. And um, so 
with with civilian search and rescue, I mean, you did this for 15 years and and a lot happened in Alaska over this time period, like climbing on Denali really became more and more popular and more and more crowded. And I think the guiding companies made it possible for people who maybe normally wouldn't be able to climb um, a mountain like that and made it easier for less skilled climbers to, to yeah. attempt large peaks. Um, yep. So you've had a couple of interesting things happen on Denali and and I I didn't have enough time to look up what's the highest crike ever performed in the world, but uh, tell me tell me a little bit about a crike that was performed at a, quite a high altitude on Denali. Yeah, that was a a, a good friend of mine, uh, Bobby Schnell. He it was an, a, another person that had fallen on the autobahn, and um, and one thing led to another, and they he couldn't continue to. Uh, secure his airway and they didn't have the equipment to intubate, you know, learn, learn to scope or and you know what I mean? And so they mm -hmm. just, they cracked him and ended up being the life-saving um, procedure for this person. In a and tent. it's not a common in a, in a, procedure no, in a tent. Yeah. Yeah. In a tent uh -huh. at 17,000 feet where your oxygen saturations mm -hmm. just normally are in the sixties, let alone having an injury. Um, yeah. yeah, you have an injury. You're cold. It, all, all, all of the bad, and you're at altitude. All the, all the bad things to happen together. Um, yeah. So he saved this person's life with a cryo with a cryothyrotomy at seventeen thousand feet. He did, and I think he sat at him for a couple of days before they were able to uh, fly the helicopter up there. That's some serious prolonged field care. Yeah, and managing yeah. it for days. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a procedure that some, there are ER docs who have probably never done one because they've yeah. never had to. And yeah. that's really good for him. Right. You should be very proud right. of that. Yeah. Right place, right time. There, I, there's, there's a whole litany of stories of all types of rescues that have gone on up there by, and have, um, yeah, it's pretty, there's a lot of stuff that happens as you can imagine. There is, and and stuff, stuff that could happen to anybody. You know, several of my friends have been caught in avalanches or different things. It's like that they did nothing wrong other than being there. Like yeah. the, the weather was acceptable, the snowpack was acceptable. It just, it's just really bad luck sometimes. sometimes yeah, it's not. Yeah. Sometimes it's not a mistake other than other than simply being there. Absolutely. So how how high up Denali do bears go? Oh. <laughs> Um, that's a good question. I'm trying to think, I think that's that a bear got into a cache. I I'll have to reconfirm and get back with you on the exact altitude, mm -hmm. but I, I think that 11,000 feet, um, a bear got into a cache. Uh, yeah. Yep. But I'll, and I'll Alaska's get back with you on that. Of course, of course, no worries. And Alaska's known for bear maulings. Mm -hmm. Um, so how often do, do you and your paramedic para jumper colleagues have to respond to, to scenes like this? I mean, it, it's not a thing that happens all the time, but it, that we, I, I always feel like we had a few a year. Yeah, there's there. It's not something that happens all the time. I would say that there's been approximately five, um, calls missions that, uh, the, the two twelfth and two tenth have, have, uh, responded to that were bear maulings. Yep. And, Some of them and in these, were, how how often are they survived? Yeah, I was, was going to say uh, maybe half of them. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty grisly and gruesome. <laughs> Literally <laughs> grisly and definitely gruesome. Yeah. Um, so, what kind of bear protection do you take with you? Uh, well, uh, I've I've spent uh, a lot of time in this state walking around, walking and traveling. Um, for fun, uh, uh, and generally, I just bring bear spray. I mean, I've walked thousands okay. and thousands of miles all over the state, and and bear spray is all I take. I don't, I don't subscribe. Have you ever to had to deploy gun. it? Uh, no, I've had to take it out though. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've never had. I've we've been charged a, a couple times, but they're usually bluffs, and they they tend to go on their way. Um, oftentimes they're scared of you, uh, when the times that they're aggressive, I believe they're with their, it's a mom with their cubs 
or they're sitting or the animal is sitting on a dead kill. And they're afraid you're so, going to take it. Yeah. So I, yeah, back to the bear spray. Th I, the bear spray is shown to be more effective than a gun. It has a wider berth of, it's a spray. And when, when you're, when you're being attacked like that, how do you know you're going to have the wherewithal to do the right thing with that gun? That's, that's my two cents on that. Someone that's yeah, I, I shot that's a metric, nice. a metric ton of bullets in training um, and in combat. I, I believe in that bear spray. I've always heard that a gun might just make the bear mad. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are people that are definitely successful with the gun with bears. There's, there's no doubt. Yeah. But. Is there any, do you have any advice for people adventuring out in Alaska and in, in other places where there are bears for, for like avoiding the bears or for getting the bear to stand down? Yeah, so avoiding them, like I said, I oftentimes they don't want to be around you. They're they're when you're in these remote places of Alaska, they're they're not used to seeing people. Um, so if you're noisy, and uh, and you they're they're going to hear you, and they're going to be gone before you even come close to them. So being noisy, always talking. You know, a lot of people that go do solo trips and and they'll sing songs all the time and. Um, some people carry bells that's controversial if that really works or not. Um, so, yeah. So you were stationed up on Denali, back to Denali. You were stationed up there for a month at a time. And, um, have you ever, has it ever felt like a mass casualty incident where you feel like you have more patients than, than you or your team can, can handle? Yeah, I haven't, we, we had one, <laughs> Back to the story that uh, my partner and I went for a ride down the Autobahn. Uh, a couple, it was a couple days before that trip that we took up to the top. We had two climbers that fell from Denali Pass. Uh, there were two Spanish climbers that fell from Denali Pass, and uh, and they were both incapacitated, incoherent, unconscious. Um, GCS of four five, somewhere in there, both of them. And by the time, so we had gone to bed this one particular evening and, uh, and one of the guided concession, one of the guide concessions up there, they came and knocked on the tent and I said, but we see some dots way out in the Peters at the base of the Autobahn. And, uh, so we got out and we looked over there with the binoculars and sure enough, there are two people. So my partner, uh, Tucker Chenoweth, who is the, uh, the head climbing ranger in the South District climbing range or South District Ranger for Denali National Park. Now, he and I walked out there, walked by, the, assessed the first person. He seemed the worst. The other guy was trying to get to his feet and couldn't couldn't talk. Um, this the first guy had severe head trauma. Uh, both boots were ripped off. Both gloves were ripped off. They had been out there for a while, so they had frostbitten hands and feet. Uh, then we moved on. We left him, went to the second guy to assess him. And uh, we were able to, Tucker and I were able to kind of pick him up and carry him together, which uh, was, I don't know, maybe a mile back to our camp. Uh, I'd have to go on the map and really look. It seemed it seemed like a long time because it's 17,000 feet. 17,000 feet on Denali feels much different than 17,000 feet on on Everest because of the where you where you are in latitude. I'm sure you know that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So 17,000 feet on Denali feels more probably like 19,000 on Everest. So back to the back to that story. So we carried him back. Uh, while we we're doing that, another one of our teams set up a tent that was going to be our medical tent because we didn't we had to put them somewhere. And then we drug a sled back out and put this other guy in the sled and drug him back. And then we have very limited capability up there as we talked about earlier. Uh, so we, I drained all the oxygen that we had. Um, we just continued to keep them warm, rewarm them uh, with hot water bottles, re recycling them throughout the night. Um, and uh, 
And that's it. They were both multi-system trauma, broken ribs, broken spines, broken necks, head trauma. Um, yeah, pneumos. I think I did, I did dart one of them. Yeah. Anyway. Wow. And so how many days did, how, how long did you have them with you up there? So that happened. I think, I think we got them back to the tent, uh, around midnight and, and, uh, and we didn't, we weren't able to get a helicopter up there until noon the next day, I think. So through the night, but maybe, so maybe 16, 18 hours, 18 hours. Yeah. How do you heat up water bottles up there? Oh, just boil water with your stove. Okay. Yeah. Boil water and then just you just keep keep doing that. Keep heating them up. Put them in the sleeping bags. I think we were recycling. You know, each each person had six per bag, and we just keep okay. on recycling. Okay, I yeah. like that idea. Everyone, take note. <laughs> Boil water and hot water bottles helps warm people. It's a good way to keep people warm. Yeah, and the only yeah. stove that works at altitude like that is the XGK, the MSR XGK. Whisper lights don't work. MSRXGK. Okay. Yeah. We're going to put that in the notes also. The MSRXGK. Yeah. Okay. That's the only stove that works up there. Uh, maybe there are some others, but that is the tried and true. It's very simple. Okay. It just puts out that's a lot of B2s. Too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's a good, that's really good advice. Um, so now when you jump, are you jumping from a C-130, from a, another type of fixed wing, from a helicopter? Uh, generally speaking, if it's, if it's jumping for work and for the mission, uh, we're going to jump from a C-130. We do jump from helicopters. We'll jump from anything for training. Um, we go to civilian drop zones and, and do a lot of training from civilian aircraft. Um, yeah, How so high is this C-130 when you jump out of it? It depends. It depends on what you're doing. If um, whether you're going to be doing something in combat in a free fall situation, you're going to be quite high and you're going to be wearing an oxygen mask more than likely. Um, if you're going to be doing like a mass attack kind of thing with a static line situation in combat, it's going to be low, you know, 800 to 1,000 feet. Uh, that's a static line situation. Okay. Uh, and up here in Alaska, um, when we would use uh, parachuting for for a mission, for instance, uh, when if we were to jump into the water, uh, let's say there's someone with a um, esophageal varices on a ship way out 500, 500 miles south of ADAC, we'll fly down there in the C-130. We have we have Zodiac boats that are rigged into these bundles. Uh, they're deflated and S folded on top of it itself. The engine's already attached to it. There's a, we have a compressed air um, tank that's attached to it as well. We push that out of the back of the plane and we skydive out after it. And then we land next to it, next to it in the water. We pop two buckles and then crack the, the tank and it inflates the boat. We, we dewater the engine and then motor over to the ship or the sailboat or whatever it is. Um, we we do that. We have jet skis that we drop. Are the same idea. Um, so that's that's one type of jumping that is performed by the rescue triad here in Alaska and throughout the DoD. Um, then we also have static line square. We have static line round parachutes, which allow us to jump at a lower lower altitude. Uh, like I said, eight hundred feet or, or maybe a little bit lower. Um, there isn't much, they're not very steerable. So you're, you're relying on the spot that you, that you get, um, with the wind drift indicators. Uh, and then we also do static line square, and then you can increase the altitude a little bit. And we now have a spherical parachute, very similar to, to smoke jumpers. And, uh, we'll have that same, we'll have that parachute and we can steer right down to the ground and land right where you want to land. So what kind of gear are you wearing when you're jumping into the Bering Sea? I mean, it's, it's the temperature of melted ice. Are you wearing like a wetsuit, a dry suit? Yeah, dry suits. Yep, dry suits okay. and all the, the okay. you dress for the occasion, you know. 
Yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, that is. Yeah. Yeah. And then one of these times, so for those that know uh, the Anchorage International Airport, it's called the Ted Stevens International Airport. And uh, he was a beloved senator in Alaska. And, um, and his plane went down in 2010. And you were one of the early responders to this, what I can only imagine was a horrific scene. And yeah. so um, tell me a little bit about what it was like to, to respond to a commercial aircraft in, in remote Alaska. So to just to back up a little bit, the, I get not back up, but explain a little bit more. The general aviation is a big deal here in Alaska. And there are lots of little planes that are flying around, whether they're personally owned or owned by a lodge or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and the, and the 176 um, wing, which is the pararescue men, the helicopters and the C-130s and all the maintenance people they respond to numerous aircraft crashes uh, every year um, for one reason or another, these planes are crashing. Uh, so what was it like? So we, that particular evening, we are, we had actually, we've been waiting for three days. We've been waiting to get to another airplane crash on the Kinnick Glacier, which is just outside of Anchorage here. And we would just go and sit in the helicopter. We would go fly the helicopter to the to the cloud line on that glacier and land and sit, and then watch it, watch the clouds. And if if the clouds were to lift, we we're going to race in there and get the four people that were stuck inside this fuselage uh, on this glacier. And so we were sitting there waiting to do that, and uh, and then we get called for another mission, which is what you're talking about with Senator Stevens in that plane crash. Uh, so we left there and, and that happens to be in Western Alaska and the route to get to Western Alaska, uh, in a helicopter is one of four passes. And, uh, and we, and we try going through each one of these passes. And finally we, we found one of the passes passable. Um, the weather was just too bad everywhere. So we finally went around and it required a lot of, um, I think we had to air refuel twice just to make all of this happen with our helicopters getting gas from our C-130s. And then we, we made it to Dillingham uh, and, and less than ideal, less than minimum weather. Um, landed, took a nap for a few hours and waited for the sun to come up and then went out to the site. And my partner and I, Chris Abel, got hoisted down with our equipment which included a couple uh, med packs and a backpack that had extrication equipment that we would kind of um, tear into a plane to make bigger holes to move people in and out of them. Um, so uh, and then we also went down with a Stokes litter, backboard, some other, and some other equipment. And then we kind of got in there and started getting to work. Uh, earlier in the evening, the evening before, uh, a, a helicopter had brought in a, a pediatric intensivist um, who happened to be in, be in Dillingham. So she was able to get in there and had a, a little bit of pain medication that she could give to the people. And she sat in that plane in that wreckage all evening with an EMT that was there as well. So, so we get there took stock of what was going on and may have came up with a plan. My partner, Chris, who is now a PA, um, he is, uh, he's a great guy. He, he went in and started to stabilize, deal, deal with the pain stuff so we could move these people and uh, immobilize them so we could move them without injuring them anymore. While I kind of coordinated the, the next steps of air using the helicopters and what we're going to do next. Um, and as well as cutting a big hole in the back of the plane that we could move these people that needed to be immobilized along long board. And so that extrication gear gets to use. All while we're doing this, uh, because it's such a high visibility situation with Senator Stevens, they, they, they threw a lot of resources at it. And uh, the Coast Guard showed up and a rescue swimmer came down and helped us out moving patients out of the out of the plane 
and then over to a, an area that um, that we were hoisting from. And then we loaded two patients on his helicopter, the two the least um, critical, because he's I think he's trained to an EMT level. And then uh, so he left, went back. They went back to Dillingham. Our helicopter came in, and we loaded two more patients with um, with our helicopter and Chris went back with them. And then they came back and I think we did one more load to get the rest of the survivors out. And then we, uh, we another helicopter crew from our helicopter squadron was flown out in the C-130. They then got on the helicopter because we had been up all night. Our pilots had been up all night and they went out and recovered the, the deceased. So, well, and that just sounds like a horrific scene. And um, I just think you're all heroes for going oh, in, into yes. those situations. And, you know, we always say look for the helpers. And you know, you're doing our job. Definitely a look. Uh, it is, it's a job, but it's look for the helpers. And whatever happened to the people on the glacier? Oh, yeah. The so, they this pulled is, you off of. Yeah. This is <laughs> the, the story, the, the saga goes on. The, uh, so we, we get on the C-130 and fly back with the patients and the deceased. And when we land in at Elmendorf Air Force Base, Jay Bear, at, um, right when we landed, the Army uh, guard they tried to get in there. They they saw a little bit of a, a break in the in the weather. They tried getting in there and they crashed their helicopter. And then, no. and then <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one was injured. Okay? Yep, okay. no one was injured. They just rolled. It was a, it was a, a dynamic roll. It was no, everyone was fine. And so then we, not not me and my team, they had another alert crew ready, with pilots, air crew, uh, and pirate rescue men to go up there and and do that mission. Okay. Uh, so they actually, those, those people. what ended up happening. This is, I don't know, it's been, this is 2010. So um, yeah. what ended up happening was they couldn't get in there on the helicopter again. And so the, the next PJs that were on alert this particular day, they got dropped off at the bottom of the glacier and they skied up in the snowstorm to the site. And, and then they got there in a snowstorm and I'm white out and they, I forget how long of an overland on skis it was roped up. Um, they get there and they stabilize everyone, got everyone warm again. And then when the weather broke, maybe a day or two later, they, the helicopters got in there and took everyone out. And so you, you all really do have to do some serious prolonged field care with yeah. really limited supplies. What's in your backpack? In, mm -hmm. in in really critical situations, yeah. I mean, this is yeah. Those are some good skills to have. Those are the people you want sure. with you in any situation. For sure. And so, so you do all of these intense activities. Is there anything that actually scares you? Like, are you afraid of spiders or snakes or anything? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I yeah things do scare me. Like, I I worry about my kids a lot. <laughs> I don't want them to get hurt. That's and my and my wife, and I I do worry about that. And I, it's when I let my kids go and do things, it does scare me because they both are kind of like you, know, you. Do crazy things. Um, but uh, um, I guess one thing that makes my palms sweat these days is when I'm flying and it's very turbulent and and I'm at the, like the at the limits of what the plane can, you know, handle. Um, so getting bounced around. Do you have around, any warnings? Of, pushed around. Yeah. Yep. And you, and you have small planes, correct? These are like Cessnas. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I have a super cub, a Piper super cub and a Cessna 180. Okay. Is yeah. there, is it like a weather report? Is there a warning of turbulence ever? when you kind of know it's going to sure. happen or does it just come out of nowhere? No, no. It, yeah. Sometimes there's clear air turbulence that you can never, you never know when it's going to come out, but yes, it is often 
very forecastable. Sometimes like when we go out into these the far reaches of the state to go hunting or climbing or camping or whatever, you don't have access to those services. And so yeah. we can, I can solicit some of that through an in-reach text here and there, but it's not always accurate. Um, so yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why people are crashing planes up here so often. Well, there was a weird, I don't know, I don't know if you and Alex talked about it, um, but uh, for our viewers, uh, we have a common friend, Alex Jones, uh, but there, there were like six planes that went down inside of two hours around Alaska, and one of them was one of our friends. He's okay, but it was just, it was kind of weird, because then it's like, well, was it like a EMP, or was it just, just odd luck, or, you know, what happened that made so many planes go down in such a short amount of time. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of factors. Uh, for instance, uh, Mary Peltola, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Mary Peltola, yes. she's- Yes. Uh, yep, she's one of our representatives uh, in Washington, DC, and her husband just passed in a plane crash during hunting yes. season. Yes. This year. And I just read a report today from the NTSB uh, that he had quite a load on uh, that he was flying out. And, that, and then there was a little bit of um, tumultuous winds on the departure end of where the, the dirt where he was taken off from. Oh, that just, that makes me so sad because she's it just such a, a lovely human being and they just looked so happy. And he was, it was just really nice to see him championing her yeah. through all this. Mm -hmm. And my, my our hearts, at, her, our hearts at World Extreme Medicine go out to her and her whole family. Yeah. yeah. So we'll switch gears a little bit. So what is something that as a rescuer, you wish the everyday hiker heading into the backcountry carried in their pack? Or some things, it could be a few things. It could be a few things. Um, I, think, I think what keeps your pack light and which is important <laughs> is knowledge um knowledge and how to use things and and uh and, and make the right decisions so you're not getting hurt accidents do happen of course but if you're going to have some things make sure you have some training and and know how to deal with some basic things and some things that are going to help with those basic life-saving things are like a cravat that you can make a bandage with or you can make a tourniquet with um oftentimes uh we you want to put things in your backpack that do multiple things. They, don't, they have more than one use. Um, so, uh, so I guess with that, a cravat would be one thing, and you can make a tourniquet with it, with a, making a windlass. Uh, additionally, mm -hmm. uh, a survival blanket is very important because when you do finally get control of the bleeding, you have to worry about the coagulopathy and things like patient warm is really, really important, even in the desert uh, scenarios. Um, duct tape is a great thing to have that you can make it with. Um, I, you know, oftentimes I, 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 I wouldn't take this and I wouldn't advise someone to take it if they don't have the right training, but, uh, but a 14 gauge three to decompress along if you need to, because that's that's an airway life. It's a quick life saving thing that's gonna gonna help you to the next steps. And it's a lot it's a lot kinder than it. It's a kinder than a yeah. like a like a dirty knife and a finger thoracotomy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A needle decompression. Yeah, and in that case, a, yeah. They're gonna those people if they knew, do need a needle, they are gonna buy a tube, right? But, um, uh, but um, yeah, I think I think that's. But you can buy them time with that. You can buy them time. Yeah. So after all this, there? I think that's it. Oh yeah. Well, that's, one, a, that's a good list. I like that list. Yeah. One other thing that like it seems like I have with everything that uh, you keep your skis together with. I don't know, they're like volet straps is what they call them. Um, yes. 
but you can kind of keep all that stuff together with the volley strap and then that volley strap has its use you so you're going to use it to make part of a litter or whatever and if everyone has the same stuff then you have a couple of straps to make your litter you know what i mean I like that and that I'm I'm going to add that to my kit. <laughs> I'm definitely adding that to my kit. Um, so after all of this, jumping out of planes, living on Denali for months at a time, after all this, you decided it's time to slow it down a little. Um, but you, you don't seem like a person to sit idle and you joined the Anchorage Fire Department as a firefighter paramedic, um, which for many people is not at all slow and might be the the most gung ho that they go. Um, and so what made you want to experience um, ground EMS? You know, the, the, the training that I, that we got to get our paramedic, uh, you, of course you go do your clongs and, and you get some experience, but at the end of the day, you're not a real street medic. There's a lot more involved to be in a street medic than there was to be in a, like a trombat. And, you know, uh, so it just seemed like a, a logical next step for me. In fact, I was actually going to go to PA school, but life got a hold of me. And, and, and I'm actually glad that I went to the fire department because, um, it, it was, a, it was a good challenge and it was really the people that I worked with. That's, that's really important to any workplace, any job satisfaction. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that I did that. And to get the change and get an experience, another base of experience that I didn't have. Uh, and so even Anchorage is pretty vast. Like Alaska is vast and Anchorage as a city is vast. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Are there, is there ever a challenge of we can't go fast enough. You know, I wish I could just jump out of a plane and get there already. Um, yeah. Yeah. Dude. It's like you're racing all over town here. Um, for sure. Um, but you know, we just like, any do you ever collaborate, like meet up with the air air crews? Oh, with the air guard out there. Uh, the only time that we would, with them, uh, is if, they brought in someone on their C-130 and we would bring them their C-130 at the base and put them in the ambulance and bring them to the hospital because they don't have that capability. That's one situation. Another situation is coordinating um, mud rescue, you know, right here in Anchorage, the tide goes out and there's, there are big people go out and walk on the mud and get stuck in the mud and can't get out. And so sometimes we'll coordinate with them to go and help those people. Or um, sometimes there'll be, a, when the tide does come in, there are boats out there, uh, they'll coordinate to someone that's in a disabled boat out in Cook Inlet. Um, yeah, that's the extent of the interaction between the guard and the, the Anchorage Fire Department. Being stuck out in that mud with that tide coming in is, I've watched that tide come in. I mean, that, it doesn't happen very slowly. It comes in fairly quickly in some places and it, that just, it just seems quite terrifying. How, how often does that happen that people hike out there and get stuck in the mud? Yearly, multiple times a year. And, and I, and I, I don't, don't quote me on how often people die die every year, every other year or so. Um, there was someone, was it this year or this last year, they they were on their honeymoon and the guy got caught. And then they, and no one could get to him. No one so, could reach yeah. him in time and he drowned. Yeah. Gosh, that's horrible. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. That is horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. So, so then, oh, what comes after the fire department? Uh, <laughs> so I, 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 although I did enjoy, excuse me, uh, working at the fire department and working with the people and, and I, I love the leadership and um, a guy that I, I ski with and fly with, 
like we have skis for our planes and we go flying in the mountains and ski and um he was a pilot for guardian flight and um ops wanting to have more time to go and ski and and such and play in the mountains but uh he he sent me a note one day saying that the crews the, the medic crews are going to be changing their schedule and there might be something that you want to consider a bunch of people and so at, in the beginning i was like well i have a good i make a good paycheck and and bad even though i'm tired often from being up all night um i think it'll be okay I got to talking with my wife about it and she's like, why don't you just put your name in the hat and see if they want to interview you, something that would work out. And so here we are. Uh, and, at, and at the end of the day, I I, I think things are meant to be, uh, I do think this is a new challenging phase in medicine for me. Like I've never had to deal with these T1 vent, Hamilton ventilators and pumps, IV pumps, and the myriad of drugs that we have that we didn't have at the Anchorage Fire Department because it's much longer prolonged care. Um, so I, it it's been a it's been a nice move. And have you ever seen the Northern Lights from any of your planes during like during a call or just in general? Oh in Alaska? yeah. Oh for sure. Absolutely. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty magical. They've been it's been nice and clear lately. And they've been active. Have you oh, that's have time up here? I have. So I, I have seen them once in Alaska because they didn't always happen down out in the Aleutians where we were. We were kind of further down the chain and we were often outside kind of the, the zone. Um, but I've seen them in northern Wisconsin twice and in Minnesota once and Alaska once. And it just every time you just stand there just with jaw yeah. on the ground because it's so beautiful and it's just surreal yeah yeah have you ever seen anything that you would qual classify as a, a unidentified flying object <laughs> no i don't think so <laughs> although, although <laughs> when i was a combat uh, okay so when i was a combat controller um we would do a lot of our training uh calling you an airstrike type training it's called uh, Joint Special Tactics Air Controller JTAC training in, in Gila Bend in Mexico. And so you're out there in the middle of the night calling airstrikes mock targets and um uh, and and they they drop flares, these planes that will illuminate the sky. Um sometimes yeah, and so and I the neighboring town of Gila Bend they would often say like, this is where it's come, but they don't realize that these these fighter planes are dropped. So no, I have not seen uh, what I would think is a UFO. Uh, yep, yep. But it's kind of funny that that was <laughs> a phenomenon down there. Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so what advice would you have for a young medic who looks at this incredibly diverse portfolio career you've had? You've been able to climb mountains. You've been able to be a, be a military hero. You've been able to skydive out of airplanes into critical patients. And so what advice would you have for a young medic who looks at you and says, I, I want to do that. I want to be that guy. Like, how do I, how do I get there? How do, how do they how do they start themselves on this path? Uh, I think, I think first and foremost, a lot of people get into this, these, these uh, this type of work, and um, and they may not have uh, a sincere desire to help. It's the number one thing that you have to have to to begin with to help to the desire to help people or to uh, be able to work as a team together. Uh, is really really important. Whether it's your team or someone that you ran into, that you're, and they're they're already there, or they come to help you. It's important to be a good team player. But as far as um, going down the road, that they they really have changed the construct of the selection process, and I'm I'm not really sure what that what it entails 
these days because it has just changed until when I went through it. It was in basic training. I had to take a pass test, which was a swim and a run and some calisthenics. And you win the door to go through the indoctrination course. Uh, I'm quite sure that there is still an indoctrination course, and that's like the selection. And it's, and it was t- ten weeks of a group of benchmarks that you had to meet each week and a bunch of different modalities. Uh, and then if you made it through that, then you would go into the pipeline of trading. So I guess if if you are going to uh, our rescue um, in the Air Force, then uh, you have to you have to be a, you have to have like the no quit um, ethos in you. Um, and you said something interesting to me. You said uh, you said uh, like no bad attitudes. You know, you have to bring the right attitude to it, and and the will makes yeah. the way. Yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and if you have, if, if you have a bad attitude, and you're going to point the finger at someone else, it's just not going to work out for you. It's just not. Definitely not in the seals. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, we I we did here in Alaska, and and we. And we won. And oftentimes, I would think about like why we would. One of the reasons we were we would win is the home court advantage. But um, number two is the the people that we that were on our team. They're just happy, willing to get the job done, willing to pump and prop your partners up, starting to fall back or feel down. Um, yeah. Yep. And and you put in your time too. You know, you didn't just snap your fingers and I'm I'm a paramedic jumping out of a plane. You know, you put in six years of active duty, setting up you know setting up communications and you yep. know you did you you put in your time. So I would advise young people to don't be afraid to put in the time. If you want to be a doctor, you have to go to four years of medical school. Yeah, yeah. Then, you have to put the any. Time uh, in. Yes. Yep. Any last words of wisdom for our listeners before we bid them bid them goodbye? Uh, I don't think so. I think yeah, just just um, do it for the right reason. The path that you want to take. It's it's been extremely re- rewarding for me. I I don't think that uh, I would have changed any chapters <laughs> of my life uh, with regard to. <laughs> my my job choices yeah always and always strive to better yourself and that's another reason why you know i went to the fire department i'm doing this like i I need to change it refresh you know challenge yourself even at 50 years old um (laughs) paramedic john davis thank you very much for spending time with me this evening and and thank you again to everyone listening I'm Dr. Sarah Spellsberg, and it is my pleasure to share these extreme medicine adventures with you. And if you're listening with us, you too are an extreme medic, and we welcome you to the World Extreme Medicine family. So stay safe out there and always keep pushing your boundaries. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to. Please also head over to the World Extreme Medicine website where you can find more engaging content on extreme medicine webinars and indeed the collection of courses from our global network, including humanitarian, disaster relief, expedition, space, military, tactical, and performance medicine. Thanks again.